Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Good to have you here this evening. This topic, 9.97562, possible pitfalls in, in, in investment planning, there obviously is some tongue in cheek in this, but we'll find out what it is in the, you know, uh, down the line. But at the end of the day, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is really just the more subtle, the, the more subtle pitfalls in investment planning. Some of them are the softer issues that we might experience. A lot of them are known, but maybe we don't pay enough attention to them. And that's what I want to try and get across to you this evening is maybe we need to pay a bit more attention to some of these issues because it'll help us invest better. And that's that's the bottom line. So what they're going to do is they are going to be enlightening. They're also going to challenge your thinking a bit, maybe even make you feel a bit uncomfortable. But that's always good for us because it makes us think outside of the box. All right. So if we look at pitfalls in investment planning, I think the first thing I want to really stress strongly is the, the concept of being responsible. Uh, in the world today, and, you, and you, if you read that uh, quote by Paul Ryan, in the world today, I think responsibility or self-responsibility or the concept of taking responsibility has disappeared. We are happier to be victims than to be responsible of what we, for the decisions we make. And in the investment planning world, we hear about it a lot. People are victims of scams, victims of inflation, victims of poor planning, victims of market movement. And I think that if we turned that around and said, what happens if the concept of a victim didn't exist? Imagine if, we, if, if you just couldn't be a victim. What choice would you have? Well, you'd have to be responsible, wouldn't you? You'd have to take responsibility. Now, that's easy for me to say. I'm in this industry, and there's a lot of nuances and innuendos, and it's, there's technicality in our industry. But I think that if we look at the, at the responsibility of our lives, it's so important to empower ourselves enough. Welcome, people. It's so important to empower ourselves enough to make a good decision. And this is where self-responsibility comes into it. So what I want to try and stress to you is what it feels like to be responsible. And if I ask you the question, what does it feel like to be responsible? Your immediate response is going to be, you're going to go into your head and you're going to, th you're going to say, what, is it, what, what I think responsibility is. I'm asking you the question, what does it feel like to be responsible? Responsibility is an urgency, isn't it? Imagine if... Imagine, and I think the best way I can, well, the best analogy I can use here is, have any of you ever had a sick child, a really sick child, or a really sick parent, or a really sick animal? Uh, or you've made a mistake at work that you just have to fix. You're the only person who can fix it. The buck stops with you. What did that feel like? What was that feeling like? It was, yes. There's a gentleman in the front row for those people listening, uh, <laughs> saying his stomach was churning. And really, that is what we need to do. We need to develop that feeling of urgency. In other words, we really want to be responsible for the decisions we're making. So what does that mean if you are someone who's not educated in this industry? It's quite difficult, isn't it? So it's easy for me to say it. But what you really need to do is ask enough questions to make an educated decision. That's what you've got to do. And that person who is your professional advisor or investment planner needs to be willing to give you that information, to spend the time with you, to go through that process. If they're not, honestly, I would move on. I would move on from them. Because I think that any kind of investment planning where you, use, you engage with a professional is a partnership. It's not about handing over or abdicating your own responsibility in the decision-making process. So what I'm actually saying to you is take responsibility for the decision you make. And that takes quite a lot of effort, doesn't it? If you abdicate your responsibility, if you give it over entirely to the investment professional, what happens is, I mean, the buck stops still with you. It's your money. So what we need to do is then sit down with that professional and say, right, this is what I want from you. I want you to educate me properly. I want you to spend time with me. I want to know what's going on. I don't, I mean, I don't expect you to know what I know. This is not your industry. But 
for you to tick the box and say, yes, I want to do this, you need to know enough. If you just say, go ahead and, and do it anyway, you've abdicated responsibility. So my premise is please use your own feeling and the fact that responsibility is a very important part of the decision-making process to set up your planning and your, and your long-term um, uh, goals. Investment professionals are required to be educated in the financial planning industry. The members of the Financial Planning Institute carry a, a, a trademark called the Certified Financial Planner. To, to maintain that, we, ha we actually have to keep up a level of education every year. It's con continuing pro continuous professional development points. It's literally hours that you've got to spend. And the Financial Planning industry for ex Institute, for example, says, right, you've got to have 35 points a year, uh, yet you've got to have clocked up in knowledge, skill, all of those things to maintain that title. And chartered accountants are similar. You know, they also have to have certain points. They've got to be very knowledgeable and in the, in the moment. They've got to be dynamic and up to date. So your financial planners need to do that for you. And you must insist on, on seeing that. And secondly, they need to give you the time. But if they do, remember that it's an exchange of energy. They're going to need to be paid for it. And you've got to try and work out how that's going to work. I mean, most financial planners will sit down with you and say, right, this is how I work. This is how I charge. Most investment professionals will do that because everything is now open book. And it's up to you to decide whether that's worth your while or not. And what are you having to do in that process as the investor? And is that person adding enough value to receive that, that remuneration? Okay, so self-responsibility, not something you probably thought I was going to start with. <laughs> And possibly has challenged your thinking a bit and, and made you feel a bit uncomfortable. But it's certainly, I know, the people that I've dealt with in my life, the people that have, uh, you know, said, right, I know I'm responsible for the ultimate decision. I've done the best. They, are, they come into my offices. They, they ask for information all the time. Um, we have two ladies in the front show that are always asking for information, which is fantastic. That's what you've got to do. And good questions. So, you know, I think that's, that's certainly... One of the first uh, pitfalls is that if we don't take enough responsibility, we could have a problem. The second one is emotion. Now, this is cliched because everyone talks about how emotion affects our decision-making process. But how many of us actually really acknowledge it and, and take it into account? I've actually shown this slide before years ago in a, in a talk I did. But this, was, this is what um, behavioral scientists in fact, if you look at the bottom, it's Dr. Schliebusch. He's actually a University of Natal. He was a University of Natal professor. And he put together this model. And his feeling, or well, his research, sorry, was that everything that we experience starts with a thought. Okay, so everything starts with a thought. Uh, that's why they say um, thought becomes matter. Because... We have to, any invention has, has always started with a thought, hasn't it? Okay, so it leads on to an emotion. So the thought leads on to an emotion, and then we have a feeling, which then results in us acting. And the feeling is literally just the thought manifested in, in, in our physicality. It's how we feel our thought. So I've added this in perception because we start life and we have no influences really. And as we grow through life, we are very influenced by whatever is happening around us. Our parents, we're told we're good or bad. We learn from our parents. We learn from our friends. We learn from the environment. And often we develop misguided perceptions. And that ends up affecting what we do in our investment process. It leads to us following the herd, you know, selling, selling at the wrong time, selling low and buying high is usually what, what the herd does. It leads to that kind of thing because we have a misguided perception of ourselves. Um, and if we, look at, if we looked at the process of investment planning or how we would go about setting a plan in place, what you really want to do is, let's say you have a target, you want to retire at X date and you need X amount of money. You're going to sit with an, a professional or you might even do it yourself and you're going to say, right, I have X amount of money currently. I have that much that I can save still, maybe monthly, but I want to be over there. And 
in the industry at the moment, most of the planners will turn around and say to you, right, to get there, you're going to have to get this much return. And that means you're going to have to either have this much money or you're going to have to grow your return drastically. And for that reason, you have to be aggressive in your, pro in your profile. Now, a lot of us in this room are not able to stomach aggressive. The volatility that we go through, that experience is difficult. That's when you need someone very close to you holding your hands through the process. But let me ask the question. Is there anyone in this room at the moment who does feel that if I said on a scale of 1 to 10, where, where, do, you, where do you fit? Does anyone in this room feel that an 8 to 10 in terms of how they would approach investing? Fairly aggressive, moderately aggressive, too aggressive. Okay. You're also aggressive. All right, that's actually quite a, that's quite a few. Okay. Now, the next question is, if the stock market dropped by 50% tomorrow, all right, what would those people that have said they're aggressive, just anyone can answer. Uh, this is not a test. This is not a right or wrong answer. What would you do? First of all, would you stay in, just stay as is? Secondly, would you run for the hills with your tail between your legs? Or would you add more money? Okay. Because then there's 50% in one day. Yeah. Definitely add more money. Okay. That's, and that's in the planning process. That's, the, the, that's exactly, in other words, you match what you said you were. Okay. And you're, if your target is that you have to be aggressive, you match it. But some people don't. So some people have to produce 15% per annum to get to their target but they actually cannot stomach it. They're risk averse. If at best, they're moderate in sort of how they think. And that's when you have to turn around the, the discussion. Uh, you know, and that's where emotion can become a really big problem. It can be a big problem for, I've heard of a story of a psychiatrist who, I mean, this is a person who teaches you how not to, how to deal with your emotion. Becoming very emotional about the fact that the market was tumbling and he, and he and couldn't, make his, couldn't make money and he couldn't get back and he wanted to bail. So it doesn't matter how well trained you are, how strong you are. Most of it is actually experience. You have to have gone through it a bit. The next thing is that if you look at asset managers, I mean, we know the stat. 70 to 80% of the asset managers in the world do not beat their benchmarks. We know that stat. Okay. So why are they in business still? There's a lot in business, lots. I mean, there are some very good asset managers. There's that 20%. Look, the 20% is a moving target. Not necessarily that there's consistently one company in that 20%, but generally, there's a couple that are, that are always up there. But why do you think people carry on dealing with them? Because they're emotionally attached. It's comfortable. Uh, they might beat inflation and that's all right. You know, you're quite comfortable that because they're beating inflation, you know, that's, that's doing okay. Uh, but you're paying them a fee, you know, maybe you could do better just in an ETF, uh, an X tracker. So there's another factor is that they're also good at marketing. Uh, but the main thing is that we feel safe with brand names. And I'd like to just challenge that and say, just be careful of that understand that, yes, 20% do do better. And there's actually times when it's, it's greater than 20%. Depends on which, which way markets are moving. But in general, that's the stat. So what do you do? Well, you sit with your investment manager or your professional. And you ask the questions. But one thing you must also remember is that the investment manager is an emotional being too. Okay, they're professional. So you would hope that they don't let their emotions affect, you know, their decision-making process. But what you need to do is be sure of how they actually control that. So I'd ask the question of the, the investment manager, what do you do to make sure that you don't get caught up in the emotion of a situation? And believe me, when you're going through what we've gone through this year, there's a lot of managers don't know where to turn. So... And this is when long-term thinking and process becomes the most important. If the answer is, I've got a strong process, that's when you say, great. Now you can be my emotional gatekeeper. And they become your gatekeeper. And they help you through and guide you through those processes. What you want from your investment managers when the market's tumbling, and you are that aggressive person, is for that person to be phoning you and saying, listen, there's an opportunity here. That's what you want.
So, you know, I would, I would look to your managers to be that gatekeeper, but remember that we are emotional beings. There's no one that isn't, doesn't show some or feel some emotion at some point in time. And this is a pitfall that I think we don't pay enough attention to. Behavioral finance is a big thing in our industry now. But it's a, there's a lot of scientific talk. We don't go to the core of it, and that's how we feel. Simple. Simple part of it. The third pitfall. And by the way, when I, when I was researching this, this talk, I, the more I went into it, the more detail I, went, I got into uh, you know, I, I decided I'd try and make a forecast on how many pitfalls there were, I think there would be, how many of the subtle pitfalls there would be. And that's where I came up with the 9.97562 pitfalls. So we'll see whether I'm right at the end of the talk. Okay. Correlation and diversification. Um, in the interest of diversification or in the effort to try and diversify, what a lot of people do in their portfolios is they invest in, port, in stocks or in unit trusts that actually are very similar. In other words, they correlate very closely. And if you look there, I mean, the definition of correlation, uh, it's a statistic that measures the degree to which two securities move in relation to each other. Okay, so correlation is computed into what is known as the correlation coefficient. This is all mathematical stuff, which has value that must fall between minus one and one. All right, so if you have two shares and they're very similar com companies and same sectors, you might see them correlating very closely. Depends what they're doing, but, but they'd have to be doing very similar things. So they would actually be, their coefficient would be one. In other words, they almost exactly correlate. If one moves, the other one moves up. If one moves down, the other one moves down. So they move exactly the same. Then if you get a share and then you have a manager uh, shorting that share, in other words, betting that it's going to drop. The correlation between those two, the normal share with a long view and the short, is a negative correlation. In other words, a complete negative one. If you look at our stock market, uh, the all share index is made up of about 162 shares. And, you're, and, that, and that's based on market capitalization, which is just the definition of market cap is just market value. Um, of the outstanding shares or the market value of the shares owned by individual investors, institutions, and staff. And if you look at our, our market, we, the top 40 shares, we all know, you know, it's, they're, they're considered the large cap shares. Then the next uh, 60 are considered the mid caps and the next 60 are small caps. And then you get obviously many more shares beyond that. And if you, if you, had to try and if I had to do create an example of what correlation would be, if you took Satrix 40 for example, you would expect that to be very perfectly correlated to the top 40 because that's what it's matching. In fact, there'll be a slight difference because of tracking error, because that manager's got to try and buy the stocks exactly. But that's going to be completely correlated. However, the last 60, the small caps their correlation to the large caps would be obviously lower, but it'll still be a positive correlation. Okay. So why am I going on about this? Well, I, we see it often. Uh, share portfolios, people, especially when people are managing their own money, they buy stocks that are quite closely correlated or they buy four different unit trust funds, all equity funds, and they buy managers that are actually very similar in style. And so when you drill down and you look into that into the unit trusts, they're actually holding very similar stocks. So, you know, you might as well then go and find the least expensive manager and just pay them because <laughs> you're buying you're buying the same thing. Okay, I'm I'm trivializing it a bit because most managers have slight subtleties in how they manage money, but you know, that would be what, what you might as well do. So you need to consider that. Um, diversification is also it's vital in a portfolio. Um, Harry Markowitz, you know, he was the man who coined the phrase, um, diversification is the only free lunch. And I mean, he's right, you know, you, especially in markets that we're going through now, you know, you need to be diversified. There's just no direction. We don't know what's going to happen next. We have Gordon Gates going on at the moment. We had Nanny Gates, you know, a year ago or nine or 10 months ago. We don't know what's next. 
you know, we, anything can happen. So, so you, did, you need to be diversified. But what we need to also understand is that, in fact, what provides you the, the greatest return in a portfolio is your asset allocation. That's actually what provides you the greatest return. So I maybe should have said correlation, diversification, and asset allocation in the, he the heading of the, of the slide. But that is the, the truth of it. If you, if you just take a share portfolio of 20 stocks, let's say, and you equal weight them, in other words, you hold 5% of each to, to hold 100%. Obviously, that's they equity weighted, but most asset managers will not do that. They're going to take bets on sectors. There might be one sector that's doing pretty well. So they might hold an overweight position in the resource shares that they hold. And then they'll, they'll have to hold an underweight somewhere else. But if they get that wrong, and, you, and, and, the, and the stock they're holding at 2% of the portfolio runs, what's it done for you? It works in the, in the other direction too. Sometimes holding a lower value helps you because it, you know, it goes in the wrong direction. The, the share drops and it, it benefits you. So you might find some asset managers making great stock pick calls, but because they're holding very low weightings uh, in the, in the, you know, relative to, they actually don't really affect the portfolio that positively. And there's a lot of detail behind the scenes of why some managers will hold 1% you know, of a stock um, because they, they're actually benchmarking against the, the, the all share index, for example, and that share as a representation in the index is only 0.5% of the index. So by them holding 1%, they're actually holding more than the index holds. And mathematically, that means that they will make money if the market, if that share drives up, they'll beat the market, basically. So correlation, diversification, and asset allocation are, are important things to consider. And I encourage you to make sure that you don't um, overstate the number of unit trusts you have in your portfolios or the number of stocks or the sectors. Be careful of that. If you're going to hold five equity funds, make sure they're not correlated. Uh, I've read a, a research paper recently where if you took an investor who just wants to invest in general equity, in other words, uh, equity unit trusts, the first fund they invest in obviously stands on its own. The second one, that they add to the portfolio adds a lot of value, especially if it's quite different, adds a lot of value to the portfolio in return and in, in risk. Because at a risk adjusted base, it actually improves the portfolio. Risk drops slightly and return actually goes up. But from there onwards, the more unit trust you add, in fact, up to five, it's actually reasonable, but it starts, it increases at a decreasing rate. So you've got to be, you've got to be very careful of, of that. And that's where you need professionals to say, listen, you know, um, this is this is actually not going to work. Uh, beyond that, you actually start beyond five, and this was a specific research paper. Beyond five, you actually start dropping your return, and increasing your risk. So just be careful of <laughs> of um, you know how you invest your money. I know this slide. I mean, the point behind this slide was actually not for the numbers. It was really just the shape. But I'll explain it to you now. You know, we've, we have Brexit that's just happened. We, well, it was a, a while back. We've had Gordon Gate on you know, Tuesday. And it, honestly, if we get caught up in all of this, we are going to obviously stop being investors and become speculators. Not so. I mean, maybe, maybe some of you in this room are speculators. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you watch your money every day. You spend four or five hours with it. But generally, most of us are investors. In other words, we're in it for the long haul. And um, this slide really shows it. So, in fact, the, the dates, you won't see it, but that's 1977, that's 2015. And what I'm trying to show you here is that why do we get so upset or scared or worried about where markets are going in the short term when look at the shape of this, this slide and this graph? It's climbed. That's what's happened just because you were in it for a while. And... I mean, you look here in, 19, in, two, in 1998, there was a crash, and then 2008. And they were painful. You know, they were apparently painful. I mean, I was in it. You know, we were all in it. But they were opportunities. That's what they were. So the reason why we do is nowadays we are so exposed to the media um, in many forms. Not, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but we get information like that. 
we can have an app that bounce, it, it bleeps us every time something happens. I mean, News24, you know, most people have got that on their phones and they're reading what's happening in the market and they're reacting. And, and obviously the press sell news. So we hear lots of words like disaster, carnage, crash, woo. Uh, I, the other day the market moved by 3% and there was a board up, I was driving up through Amshlonga, there was a board up saying the market crashed. I'm like, no, geez, when did it become 3% that a market crashes, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, speculating and investing, which one are we? Try not get caught up in that. And the biggest thing is when you are standing around the briar and Borovors, or if a conversation goes like this, Jesus, Borovors tastes good. It's very good value. Have you bought Mr. Price? They're also good value. When the conversation goes like that, I think you possibly should have been out of that share a year ago. So don't get caught up in what your friends say. Do your homework. You know, look, some guys have got good ideas. But Bright Talk, it's a, in the old days, used to say when the bellboy or the lift manager gave you a tip on a share, you should have been out of it a year, a year ago. So, so just remember that. Uh, um, a very important aspect. This is Mr. Buffett. Um, and you, you can't see, probably can't see that, but I'll read it to you. Someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. It's typical of Warren Buffett. Uh, you know, he's, he's historically been a value investor. Uh, he was a deep value investor. He was taught by uh, Benjamin Graham in the, in the 30s. Since then, he's probably more growth at a reasonable price investor, so he doesn't stick to these deep fundamentals. But... He's got, he just has very simple process. Um, he says, I invest forever. Okay. So in other words, when he buys a stock, he says, is it a stock I want to hold forever? He likes cash, uh, cash flow in a company and good management. And that he can leave them alone. He doesn't get too involved. That's how he invests. Okay. I mean, once again, I'm simplifying it. But th this is a man we need to listen to. You know, he's done a few good things for the world. If anything, he's taught us how to be resilient and to hold on to our investment process. But investing for life, rather than just to retirement, is a very important aspect. And I, I think a lot of people make a mistake in thinking that their retirement date is the end of their investment life. You know, it changes from there completely. So they model everything according to that. In fact, pension funds... And there's a reason why, and I'll explain why they do it. But pension funds have life cycle models where as you get closer to your retirement date, they start reducing the risk exposure. So you'll find that people that have three to five years to go to retirement from the fund will have a much lower equity allocation to their, or share allocation to their portfolio. And, you know, they have to do that because they don't know what that individual has aside from that pension fund. The trustees are worried about being sued. There's all of this, and they're trying to protect people's capital. If they could actually look at what the investor had, they might change that view completely. And that's why I encourage people to invest for life rather than to 65. If you don't have a pension fund, you run your own business, just remember that it doesn't stop at 65. Sure, when you get closer to that date, you need to look at the market. You need to look at your needs. You need to look at how much money you have because it really does depend on that too. I mean, the person who retires and has more than enough money um, can maybe be more risky, you know. The person who's going to be right on the knife's edge, that's, they've got to be very careful about what they do and how they allocate their assets. But we are living longer now. And I did a talk on this a few years ago on the concept of retirement. You know, is it is it disappearing as a concept? Companies are, they still have a retirement age, 65, you know, but a lot of them are extending the contracts. In fact, some of the co companies employ people without a, a final date. Around the world, that's happening much more. So I think we, and, and why they're doing that is because we know that people are going to live into their 90s and into their hundreds. So if you're going to retire at 65, you've got 30 years to go. That's a lot. So it's something to really consider. Uh, and the other thing you, you must consider that at retirement date, in fact, your expenses climb a bit. 
For, uh, is anyone in this room who is retired? Yes. Okay. What happens is, first of all, the first few years you go and travel a lot. Secondly, there's this void because you've no, you're no longer <laughs> in a work. And so you end up, you know, doing a lot more. And I don't think people remember that. You know, they forget the fact that that's, possi that's a possibility. So they spend more in the earlier days. So when you do your planning, make sure you, you accommodate that fact that you might actually need more money for the first few years of your of your retirement than you thought, not just 15,000 a month or 20,000 a month. So I'm not trivializing the fact that uh, pension funds do the, I'm not saying the pension funds do the wrong thing. What I'm saying is that we are lifetime investors. That's what we are. And you can actually, I, I think if you look at most portfolios today, um, there's, there's too little risk in them, especially young people. We have a regulation in our pensions fund act Regulation 28. It restricts how much you can put into the equity market to 75% and combined with listed property to at 90%. So it restricts what you can do. And I think that is a huge mistake. Because why would a 25 year old not want to be in the market? We can see historically what markets have done. So, in a way, our governments and our legislation is actually creating the problem they're trying to avoid by state funding and all of those things that come into it. So, yeah, we need, to, we need to really consider the fact that we should be investing for life. Then pitfall number six, values and goals. And there's lots of words up there, but what I want to try and really get to is that if our goals, if we have goals that don't align with our values, okay, what will end up happening is either we'll reach that goal. Oh, that was. <laughs> either we'll reach the. <laughs> someone took a photo. It seems. <laughs> either we'll reach that goal, and it'll feel empty. We'll feel empty. It'll be. Oh, why did I even have the? Why did I even bother with that goal? Or secondly, it'll take us so much energy to get to that goal, because it doesn't align with who we really are. So what does that imply? That we need to understand ourselves. We need to know who we are as investors. So that we can align our goals and values. And, I mean, yes, you know, Roy Disney says, it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. And I want to use maybe an example here to try and sort of explain what I'm meaning. Uh, let's say, well, it was actually a talk I heard. It was an interview that someone did. And they were talking to this person. It was a, a life coach. And the life coach was talking to this person. who was very grumpy about the fact that their neighbor just went on holidays all the time, had lots of cars, um, you know, painted the house all the time, you know, did a number of things and, and this person couldn't. And when the coach sat down with this, this person and went through the details of their values, one of the, the primary values was their family. And the coach said to this person, what is your, you know, what do you, what, what is it that drives you the most? He said, I want to be, I'm committed to my family. My family is the most important thing to me. He said, okay, what about that person that you think is so successful? How's their family life? And the person said, well, he's never at home. the husband's never at home because he's making the money to keep up with the Joneses. Or let's be PC and so keep up with the, Gu the Guptas or the Zuptas. <laughs> but that's the reality. Don't be, I don't think we should be deceived by the fact that people have money. People have income. Some have lots of income, but they don't necessarily have money. In fact, a lot of people have more month at the end of their money. A lot of people do. And they just keep borrowing. And our world has created that culture. Because how have we grown as a world for the last 40, 50 years? We've created debt. We've printed money. And look, I'm not saying debt's a bad thing. I mean, I've used debt to make money. You know, if you can borrow cheaply and you know what you're doing, you can make money. But most people can't do that easily. And most people don't have the discipline to work the money. In fact, they go and spend the money. Okay, now we're in a world where uh, the reserve banks around the world are trying to get people to spend money because we need growth. And suddenly people have caught on, oh, I actually don't want to spend. Um, that's why we have what they call negative interest rates in certain parts of the world, where you give money to the bank and then you pay them an interest rate. That's what's happening in, in 
a large part of the world. In fact, the governments in the world, some of them are saying, well, let's do what they call a helicopter drop. Let's just drop money into people's bank accounts. Maybe they'll go and spend it. That's where we are. So uh, the biggest thing that I think we, we make a mistake with as investors is we watch other people and we start living their lives. If you can identify what really drives you, whatever that is, Sorry, I'll get that just now. <laughs> this is the phone. Um, what, what, whatever you want has got nothing to do with anyone else. It really doesn't. Your lifestyle needs are your lifestyle needs. That's it. And I know a lot of people get that. You know, we get that. But still, we play the game, don't we? Because there's magazines and there's newspapers and there's advertising showing us what we should be doing with our lives. So... When we can identify what's important to us and we get our values right and we align that to our goals, actually life goes a lot smoother. It's a lot simpler. It's not always easy, but it's, it goes a lot smoother. And Dalai Lama says, open your arms to change, but don't let go of your values. Yeah. I said earlier on in the talk, we don't take responsibility enough in this world. We, we prefer to be victims, but I think that's a culture that's just been led through the world. The first thing that people will try and do is run away from owning up to something <laughs> they're definitely going to pass the buck and if we were not if we didn't allow ourselves to be these victims of situations we'd be far better off so yes we need to we need to make sure we align our values and goals and then pitfall number seven everyone knows that medical costs are probably one of the or in fact for most retired for the average retired person it's the biggest expense usually when I mean, you look at I just quickly had a look at Discovery as an example at their executive plan and their comprehensive plan. So those are the top two plans. You, as a couple, you're paying ten and eight thousand rand a month for that. Sure, that's a fair that's a fair amount. But uh, what we don't do is, in fact, with the general part of our planning process, what we don't do is align ourselves correctly with what we need. So when you start your life and you're working towards retirement. You, you start out with very little capital, but you have needs. You might have a family. So if you happen to be disabled or you end up in the hospital and you're not covered properly, whatever savings you have is gone. It's quick. It's, so in, in other words, any investment plan that you have in place is worth nothing if you haven't planned that properly. So, And you can see the medical foundation of your financial house. It definitely is one of the foundations in your financial house, as is disability cover, uh, the walls, you could say, is the life insurance side, the roof and the ceiling. You could say now is the investment side, retirement and straight investment planning. And you could take investment planning itself and build and, and create a house with that. The foundation to your portfolio is maybe core shares, you know, the top 40. You, you, you know, you could create a, a, a platform for it like that. But this, this financial house, doesn't. it starts when you're young. It re it reach when you get to retirement, it doesn't change. You've still got a, a house that you've got to build. Um, because at retirement, you've got to consider the fact that medical inflation is going to out... It's, it's definitely going to go way beyond the normal inflation rate. So we know that. It's historically happened. Um, so I think what we don't do is we don't account for this enough in our planning process. So your investment plan needs to account for those factors, uh, you know, to make sure that you, you don't get caught out. A lot of people in the in the in the old days um, used to they used to have it included in their employment contract, didn't they? You would be covered for fifty percent of your medical aid, covered covered for the full. I mean, that's just that's unheard of nowadays. That in fact, you got you had what they called defined benefit and defined contribution funds. Defined benefit funds were a promise of a pension, had to be funded properly, and there companies started going, well, how do we fund this? And they bailed and they went into defined contribution and gave you a little bonus to move across. Um, so those days are gone now. Everything's thrown back in our court and we have to manage it. And if we don't account for, you know, the fact that we need to cover ourselves, I mean, every single one of us, without doubt, is going to need a thousand mile service at some point or a panel beating at some point. It's going to happen. Our bodies break down. Um, make sure you're covered properly for that. Right. We're at 9.97562 now. 
Forecasting, a mugs game. Maybe I should have put a question mark there rather than an exclamation mark. But you can see there that there's three forecasts that were made. One was by Richard Branson, who we all know, um, and he was completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in December 2007, Goldman Sachs Chief Investment Strategist Abby Joseph Cohen made a Fisher-like prediction of her own. She suggested that the S&P 500 would hit 1675 by the end of 2008, a climb of 14%. It actually ended it below 900. Uh, you look in South Africa, beginning of this year, just look at what the International Monetary Fund predicted for our growth. And look where it is now. They've just predicted, well, 0.1%. I think we'll be lucky to do that. So forecasting is a very difficult thing. And quite honestly, I'll go on a limb to say that the more numbers you have beyond the decimal, the more arrogant it is. <laughs> so, and forecasting, yes, yeah, so I've been very arrogant because I remember at the beginning I forecast this. But it, forecasting a, the rand is, or currency is, I mean, we get asked that question all the time. It's just... It's a mugs game. That definitely a mugs game. You can you, there's sometimes direction in a currency. You can you you can so you can statistically say, well, you know, if, if the fact that South African bonds pay the highest interest rate at the moment, uh, if America doesn't put up the interest rates, what's going to happen? Well, it's likely that money is going to keep flowing into the country. So we can say on a broad scale that the rand should be strong because money is going to flow into the country. But to predict what it's going to be at, the the Chinese amuse me because. They always are 0.1% off their prediction, which is my eyebrow is so raised, it becomes part of my hair, you know, um, on my head, because it's, I mean, it's a joke um, to, to be that sort of arrogant, you know. But we know China, and we can look at other figures to actually verify that growth rate. So, but honestly, the forecasting, but what I want to really get to here is not so much forecasting that is done in the marketplace. I mean, asset managers actually uh, require to do that. What they'll do is the analysts will look at um, earnings potential from a company and they'll make a forecast and they'll buy the stock on that basis, especially if they are growth managers or even momentum managers. Value managers might be slightly different. But what I'm talking about here is the forecast we make when we do our planning process on what we think inflation is going to be, what we think growth, our growth is going to be out of our money, and how long we think we're going to live. Because I, I, I'll venture to say that our emotion gets involved there, and sometimes our ego. Because what we'll say is, well, oh, inflation, no, oh, it'll, it'll be 6%. Quite honestly, it's, it's reported at around that at the moment, but most of our inflation is more like 8%. There's a great research paper on that, which it actually details facts, and it actually calculates it, and it comes out at 2% above what the reported inflation rate is. But it depends on what life you lead and that basket of goods but i mean inflation is one the second one is return on your money that's probably the best because most people overstate what they think the return is going to be that's an overconfidence bias we all full we're filled with biases as humans it's an overconfidence bias but just go through a period of crash and suddenly you have a pessimistic bias it's quite quick to change uh, especially if you get really burnt the only time that you, you know, you lose in the market is if you realize your loss, as we know. In fact, if a market drops, that's all it's done. It's dropped. It, it, we haven't we haven't lost. It's only when we cash in. So that that forecasting you've got to be very careful with. If you're going to sit down and do planning, be realistic about it. Make sure that you 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 know your your planning process is good, and then also be realistic about your life expectancy. You can look at your genes and your family pool and decide what you think. But I, I would venture to say just add a bit on onto that. That you know that would be a, a vital component. Oops. Seems I missed the forecast. At the beginning of the talk, I forecast that there would be nine point nine seven five six two possible pitfalls in investment planning. It turns out there were only eight. Sorry. And that's what most that's what most forecasters will do. <laughs> so please bear in mind that if you're going to forecast, especially with your own planning, be prudent, uh, you know, be conservative. 
make sure that you get to 95 with some capital. Um, and, and also use professionals, you know, to help you be gatekeepers and take responsibility for what you're doing. If you do that, your lives will be a lot better in terms of investment. Thank you, everyone.